Good afternoon, everyone. Happy New Year. I can't believe it's 2017 already. I'm really excited uh, for this year's set of live chats. My name is Lakeland Hogan, and I'm the caregiver advocate with Home Instead Senior Care. And I want to thank you all so much for joining us today uh, for our Alzheimer's Live Chat, the first one of 2017. And I'm excited because we're moving to a monthly live chat this year. Last year we did them quarterly, which were still awesome. We had lots of great participation, but we're hoping to connect with you all on more of a regular monthly basis. And we hope that you'll join us uh, throughout the year. We have lots of great topics, some great experts, um, so stay tuned to our Facebook page for those updates throughout the year. But I wanted to let you know that our live chats are brought to you by Home Instead Senior Care, a family network of locally owned franchise offices and your trusted home care agency, helping you keep your aging loved ones in their homes as they grow older. And before we get started with our chat today, I wanted to go over a few housekeeping items. We have muted all of your lines to reduce any background noise. We want you to be able to still move freely about your house, do dishes, fold laundry, whatever you need to do. Um, and don't worry about making extra noise because we can't hear, hear you on our end. Um, and then we, we welcome questions, uh, feedback as we go through today's live chat. So there is a questions box on your screen. All you have to do is type in your question if you have any that you're thinking of right now, go ahead and type those in. We'll get to those in a bit. Or, you know, as we go along, if something sparks a question, uh, if you think of one down the road, please write them in. Uh, we would love to answer those for you. Again, that box is right there on your screen. And then don't worry about taking notes. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to email you a link with this recorded webinar. And then we do have a resource slide at the end that I'll uh, I'll pull up, but we'll also send you those resources in the follow-up email. That way you don't have to jot down uh, the websites. You can access those resources at a later date. So that kind of takes care of our um, housekeeping items for today. Uh, and our topic that we're going to jump into is one that can sometimes be overwhelming for family members. And we're talking about the care decisions for your loved one. We're going to go over some advice about what to do if your loved one uh, refuses care or help, uh, hopefully learn about how to make decisions uh, that are best for your loved one, and then how to deal with that guilt. And here to talk with us today is expert Karen Garner. So we want to welcome Karen. Uh, today is the expert on our live chat. She is an advocate in the fight against Alzheimer's disease and is passionate about providing support to the families affected by the disease. Karen has personal experience as a family caregiver for her husband, Jim. Jim recently passed away from younger onset, onset Alzheimer's disease. Karen bravely shares their family's experience through her adv advocacy work. She meets with lawmakers, she is a blogger, and she participates in a variety of Alzheimer's-related events across the country. Karen is a mother of two children who are very active in sports and school activities. <laughs> She is a founder of the Garner Foundation, which you can learn more about at thegarnerfoundation.com. And then you can also read about her experiences through her different blogs at missingjim.com. And she also blogs for us on helpforalzheimersfamilies.com. So with all that being said, Karen, welcome to today's live chat. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, and thank you so much, Lakeland. Um, you know, this is one of my favorite times of the month when we get to chat and um, hear from so many people and just um, support this community of caregivers that um, really needs our help right now because I know it's such a difficult time. So thank you so much for having me. Well, we are so glad that you're here and I agree. This is um, one of my favorite hours of the month where we get to sit down and take people's questions and talk about issues that are, are happening to these family caregivers. As I talked about earlier, um, especially when it comes to making care decisions for your loved one, it can be overwhelming. Um, the options for care have really evolved over the last, you know, 10, 20 years. And when it comes to Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, that has another layer of complexity to those care decisions. Um, and so people have, they have uh, written in with some great questions. We asked people to send in their questions ahead of time. So we do have some questions. And then again, if you just joined us, um, 
please write your questions in the box there and we will um, ask them out loud here on the line. Uh, no question is a silly question. Um, the only bad questions are ones that are not asked. I heard that once and I thought that's a good, that's a good uh, point there. So please ask your questions. We're happy, happy to help. So Karen, if it's okay with you, I'm going to jump right in with some questions that we had, uh, that people had typed in ahead of time. Are you ready? I am ready. Okay. So um, when making care decisions, we had Brenda write in. She said, I wonder how other caregivers have handled nursing aid assistance without breaking the bank. Navigating the services covered under Medicare and hospice can be challenging. I think Brenda brings up a really great point. Um, you know, bringing in help, how do we do that without breaking the bank? Do you have any suggestions or thoughts, any resources for Brenda? Uh, yes. Well, first of all, hi, Brenda, and thank you so much for writing in to us. Um, obviously, we wouldn't be able to do this without our wonderful questions. And that is a question that I get asked quite a bit, and there really isn't a perfect answer. I would love to be able to say to you, um, yes, just call this 1-800 number and there is help for you. And it's as easy as that. So um, that's in a different dream world that we all live in sometimes. But to answer your question, honestly, there's really not a lot of assistance for um, nursing aid unless it's uh, unless you are qualified for Medicaid, which um, you basically have to spend everything that you own down to two thousand um, dollars. Now with Medicare, you're you're talking Medicare hospice care. Now hospice care is a little bit different because that does cover. Um, some nursing assistance. It covers a lot of different things actually and will co cover your supplies um, and they should be able to help you with the nursing aid assistance through hospice and actually um, you shouldn't have to pay for that through Medicare. Um, that doesn't even have a copay. So I'm not really sure um, based on your question if you are currently getting some hospice care are not in what state you're in. Um, it may be different in different states, but from everybody that I've spoken with about this in the past, um, I haven't seen any differences. I do know there are certain states that actually have more coverage to help with care, um, but across the board, Medicare should be the same with the hospice care. And Brenda, I think you should contact your, um, your, your person there with the hospice company that you've chosen and ask them about this. And um, it should be covered by your Medicare coverage or, or your spouses that you're taking care of or your parents that you're taking care of if they're on Medicare. Um, it should be covered for hospice. Thanks, Karen. Those are, those are some great resources. I wanted to also throw a few in there. Um, I know that the local area agencies on aging, every community has one. Uh, throughout the U.S. Um, they also will sometimes have programs like a bath aid program where they'll um, connect you with services on a sliding scale based on income and you can find where find out your local area agency on aging by uh, going to 211.org or just picking up your phone and dialing 211 um, and they can connect you with your local area agency on aging. Um, and again, they might be able to connect you with, you know, a bath aid for your loved one to help with that additional assistance. There's also grant programs that uh, your loved one might qualify for or you could apply for. Um, Hilarity for Charity has a respite care grant uh, program. And you can, I'll, I'll bring up the website, but it's helpforalzheimersfamilies.com. You can apply for that grant. Um, it's when you apply for it, it's for respite care, which could include assistance like bathing, grooming, restroom assistance, those kinds of um, kind of assist, uh, aids. And then also, um, the Alzheimer's Association across the nation, a lot of times they will have a local grant program as well. I know in my city, um, each year they do get grants where they 
will reimburse families, I think it's up to $1,000 for additional assistance in the home. So there are some options out there. Sometimes you just have to do some digging around. Um, so I definitely would encourage you to reach out to your local Alzheimer's Association. And I would agree with Karen, all the resources that she suggested, especially around hospice care. And I know that Medicare can be kind of a crazy thing to navigate. It's always changing. There's always new rules. And I did want to share um, to find out, you know, what coverage you qualify for under Medicare. Um, you can go to MedicareInteractive.org. And I, again, will pull up that resource towards the end. But it's a great interactive tool where you can ask questions. You, they even have a hotline you can call. So, again, I know navigating all of that uh, can be kind of difficult. And, Finances are always something that's kind of tricky uh, when it comes to financing uh, care. And we do have some resources, um, a little booklet that we produce at home instead. It's called the Funding Solutions Guide. So we'll include that link in the email that we send out with this video towards the end. So Karen, just wanted to throw those other resources in there based on what I've experienced with the families I work with. But did you personally, you and Jim, did you um, – have any assistance in the home, anything of that sort? You know, I, I fought like crazy. I even contacted our state senator um, and got them involved to try to get us help while Jim was still at home. And um, I, I was able to take advantage of um, a local church who had some volunteers that would help us. And there was a respite program now, it did not include thing, personal care, uh, like bathing and so forth, um, but it was a great service, and they provided us with some scholarships um, to take Jim to, and he loved it. He, he wanted to go every day. They, they sang, and they had pets and animals come in, and they had um, arts and crafts for them to do, and it was just a really nice area. So another... Another thing to look into um, is different programs that are just are, that may be in your community where you live or close by um, that the church uh, that a church has or um, some kind of community center uh, in that area. And I know the Alzheimer's Association might and should have a list there for you to get some help. And they also usually have somebody in their office. That can that can give you some tips on trying to get some some help as well. We did get some help from the Alzheimer's Association as well to help cover um, some care for Jim. Um, just like you were mentioning, Lakeley, we actually were blessed to be um, the recipient of one of those as well. And um, before we had to place Jim in a home, so so there sometimes you have to do some digging and and you actually have to. Um, let people know that you're struggling. Let people know that you need help. Let people know uh, what's going on, and you'd be surprised uh, the communities that will come out and help you uh, that you don't even know are there. So sometimes all it takes is just to um, to talk about it and and to ask for help. That's a great point, Karen. Sometimes we feel that we have to kind of do it all ourselves and. We forget that we have we can ask for help and there are people out there that will help us and I think you also brought up another great point uh, those those adult day programs are I think a very underutilized resource in communities uh, sometimes they're the best kept secret uh, so definitely reach out to your local Alzheimer's Association for some of that information or your area agency on aging um, and, and Speaking of uh, those emotions of, of caregiving, you know, feeling like you have to do everything yourself or, um, you know, these care decisions, these, are, these aren't, these um, are you know, your everyday decision of what to eat in the morning or what to wear to work, but these are, these are big decisions and it comes with a lot of emotions involved and one that I hear all the time, and I'm sure you do too, Karen, and perhaps you even felt this yourself is the feeling of guilt. And I know we had I, a handful of of people write in about their feelings of guilt um, that they're having about their, the choices that they're making for their loved ones. So I'm just going to share with you, um, I'm going to start with two of, two of them that wrote in. Um, first, Donna says, after mom lived with us for four years, I took care of her. Um, how, how do you go about putting her in a nursing home? 
uh, nursing home and turn all of that special care over to them. Uh, care is so much more or less than she was getting at home. I'm feeling so much guilt. And then um, Lisa said um, that she placed her mom in assisted living facility and she's, at, she's wanting to know how she feels so guilty about that. She's calling her at night, she's wandering, um, you know, her, she feels like her mom's safety, her health, her well-being is at risk, and she, wish, she wishes she could keep her at home, but she's just feeling um, guilt, and she's asking, how do I let go of those guilty feelings? So, Karen, clearly this, this feeling of guilt is um, something that's so prevalent. So do you have any suggestions uh, for these caregivers on how they can um, deal with these feelings or process them? Well, Lakeland, this is uh, very similar to the previous question where I wish I had a perfect answer and a simple answer. And the truth of the matter is, just like every Alzheimer's patient is different, they, the saying is, if you meet one Alzheimer's patient, you've met one Alzheimer's patient. And um, the, the crux of it is, you first of all, um, there is going to be guilt and you need to accept that and the reason you're feeling guilty is because you care um, If you didn't care so much and you weren't concerned then you wouldn't feel guilty and then that would be a whole nother issue so Embrace that guilt and know it comes with the responsibility of being the responsible person um, for either your your parent or your spouse um, whoever it is that you're having to make these decisions for and I don't um, I don't regret putting Jim in a home uh, because that was the right decision but I still even um, almost a year after he has passed away feel extremely guilty uh, even though Jim and I had lengthy conversations about this having two young kids at home um, he knew that it would be nearly impossible for me to take care of him and the kids and he wanted the kids to come first and also our home wasn't set up for it and on top of that um, he did have a violent outburst um, and it got to the point where we just didn't know how he was going to react in different situations and um, the best decision was to put him in a home and it was um, not only difficult and it does it's and I still live with that guilt but it was also one of those things where you sort of feel like you have failed and um, and as a failure you know you feel like you've let that person down or you've let your kids down or your you know whoever um, and so that's part of the problem as well Another thing is um, we tend to um, look at other people, and this is where I go back to when I just mentioned if, you, if you've met one Alzheimer's patient, you've met one Alzheimer's patient. Everybody's situation is different. Um, so you cannot compare yourself to another caregiver that you know or somebody who you know says, oh, I would never put my mom in a home I would never put my husband in a home. I'm so glad I, I cared for them to the end. You know, good for them. I am so happy for them because I wish I could have done that for Jim. But at the same time, um, you can't compare yourself because their situation is different than your situation. Um, maybe the person they're caring for doesn't have issues that the person you're caring for does. Maybe their home set up differently. Maybe they're getting some extra help or maybe that's just something that um, they can do because they're not working anymore or they don't have other family members to care for. I mean there's so many different facets of each situation to take into consideration and you can't compare apples to apples it's comparing you know apples to grapes and then to an oak tree so they're not even in the same realm so first of all you have to be kind to yourself stop comparing yourself to everybody else where is it written down in stone that you're a terrible person because you can't keep so and so at home and that you have to place them so um, to, to help with that, sometimes it's good to go to a support group if there is one. Again, the Alzheimer's Association should be able to point you in the right direction. 
I highly recommend finding a good therapist or a counselor, um, somebody you can really open up to and talk to them about these feelings of guilt. Um, find someone who specializes in uh, something similar. They won't specialize in, in this particular situation, but there should be some um, uh, counselors out there that can still help you uh, just understand the process of how you're, what you're feeling, how to handle it, um, you know, take some yoga classes if you can, go for walks, um, and, you know, do, do the best you can in your situation. I know for us, um, and one of the questions that you had, Lakeland, talked about, you know, they're not going to care for your loved one the same. And you're right, they're not, because, um, you know, they don't know that person before they've stepped foot in the door, and it's a job. And um, there are wonderful people that work at assisted living facilities who care very deeply about the um, residents and who bend over backwards, but you're also going to have some people where it is just a job and they don't go the extra mile. So you're just going to have to accept that and try to figure out schedules. If you are able to go and visit, go and visit. Go and sit during um, meal time or when they're having activities so you can see your loved one participating in, um, you know, maybe they have some clog dancers coming or they have um, somebody coming to help them with some artwork. Um, there's, there should be something going on that you can go and, and help with. You can start to volunteer there and help some of the other residents as well. Um, and that helps the staff and that um, take some burden off of them, especially maybe they're understaffed one day, somebody calls in sick or there's a lot going on. Um, I know I saw at Jim's facility uh, certain spouses would come in and just help feed residents because uh, sometimes some needed more help than others. So, um, so there's ways to get involved that will help ease that guilt that you'll feel. You still feel guilty. And um, and just don't just drop them off and then disappear, I guess, is the best way to put it. Uh, but you're going to feel that. There's some books out there. I know um, I didn't read a whole lot when this was going on because I was so busy, but after the fact, I have. Um, so go to your bookstore and you can go online. There's so many of them to choose from. Um, I would definitely try to do that as well. So I hope this helps. Thank you guys for your questions and um, and for caring so much about your loved one. That is great advice, Karen. Uh, I, I like all the suggestions that you gave. Um, yeah, I think those are, you make a lot of great points. You know, everyone's situation is different. Um, everyone's guilt is going to feel different or look different. Um, so you're right, there's not a one size fit all, but I think you gave some really good tips there, and I thank you for that. Um, I am going to segue just a little bit off topic. We did have somebody write in, Laura, um, and she has a question. In case she needed to hop off the call, I wanted to address her question right away. Um, she says, my question's a little off topic, but I'm wondering if you could provide suggestions on how to get someone to bathe. I'm caring for my father. My mom passed away three years ago. I'm so sorry about that, Laura. Um, and he recently, her father recently started giving me uh, trouble about bathing and will not let me anywhere near him. He used to do it on his own. My brother has tried, also without any luck. So Karen, do you have any advice for Laura when it comes to bathing? Um, it sounds like she could use some advice at this time. Any thoughts? Um, yes, thank you for that. And I will say there there is a lot of tips out there um, for bathing. I know when I finally realized that Jim needed help um, in the shower, it was one of those moments where it was like, oh my gosh, we're here now, because you know it's coming, but um, you know, he wasn't using shampoo, he was using conditioner as shampoo, and then not rinsing it out, or there's just a lot of different things, and um, that come along with having to help them in the shower, and First of all, my first tip is to put yourself in their position. They are probably a little embarrassed, I'm guessing, 
and um, it, you know they don't want help and they certainly don't want their children or you know their spouse helping them so that's one thing to keep in mind and to um, to keep that in mind while you are helping them the next is um, I, since I'm not quite sure what the response is, but I know I have read and seen some things in the past where um, with Alzheimer's patients and other dementias, sometimes the water when it's coming out of a shower can be painful to them. Um, so I really, you need to make sure that you check the, not only the water temperature, but how hard the water is coming out of um, the shower head. Um, something as simple as that could be putting them off from the shower. Um, and then sometimes you can get in with them or you can be right there with them and hold their hand uh, in yours. Basically, you put your hand over the top of theirs, put the um, washcloth in their hand or the soap, and then guide them so that they're basically washing themselves, but you're leading because your hand's over theirs and you're helping them wash themselves. Um, that's a tip that um, I've seen work very well. And um, obviously, you've see, probably seen that they forget how to rinse off. You know, Jim would lean his head forward, so then all the soap and water would go in his face and his eyes. They forget to lean their head back. Um, so, you know, just gentle reminders in a nice way. If you're the type of person that can possibly make a joke um, out of it, you can. Sometimes, you know, humor goes a long way. Laughter's the best medicine, but humor can help make any situation a lot lighter. Um, so, and try try to figure out if there is anything about the shower that has bothered them. Maybe they did get soap in their eyes one time or something was too hot or too cold, or maybe the bathroom is cold, so they don't want to disrobe. Um, so make sure it's a nice, comfortable temperature for them as well. Um, make sure it smells good and it, you know, it, it's soothing, you know, maybe some lavender or something calming. Even some gentle music in the background can help, uh, those types of things. And you know, chances are you're not going to be able to bathe them every day. Um, sponge baths are, go a long way as well, and um, you might have to get really good at those. There are some products out there that you can find online and at your local drugstore uh, for hair and for body for people that are bedridden. Um, and even if you're, if you're a person that you're caring for isn't bedridden, um, it's made to clean them with, without having to get up and get in the shower. So that might be something um, to look into just to keep them clean and uh, make you feel a little better and uh, and see if that helps. So I hope these tips help you. I would really love it um, if some of our listeners, I know we have quite a few people out there listening who have been through this. There are so many different things that people figure out how to do and if we all share them uh, we'll be helping each other out. So if you have some tips please feel free to send them in. Um, I know I've heard so many different ones. I, I could sit and talk to you all day and all night about it. So, um, so I'm going to stop here, but I do encourage if some people out there listening have some tips, please send them in to us and Lakeland can share them and, uh, and we can help everybody. Absolutely, yeah. So if you have some tips um, that could help in this situation, please feel free to type them in the questions box and then I'll read them out. But I had a couple others, Karen, I thought all the ones that you suggested were great, and I was thinking of a lot of the same ones that you suggested, but sometimes when it comes to bathing, um, they're feel like they can start to feel like they're losing their independence because they're needing assistance with bathing. And that could be something that your father is struggling with here. Um, so if you were to give him simple choices, for instance, um, okay, Dad, would you like to shower before breakfast or after breakfast. So he feels like he's choosing the, the shower time. Or, you know, would you like to use um, the shampoo that smells like waterfalls or the shampoo that smells like lavender? Um, you know, giving choices um, 
also modeling. So if your father is still able, if he's still mobile and is able to wash his own hair, uh, maybe you can help by putting the soap in uh, his hand and then model it. So show him how to wash uh, on your own person. So I'm the caregiver and I'm making the motions of washing my hair. Sometimes they just need those visual, visual cues in addition to the verbal cues. So I found those to be successful in some situations. And um, it's always important, too, to make sure that your loved one is safe, safe while they're bathing, uh, making sure you have all the, they need grab bars to get in and out safely. That's really important. Um, somebody, Carol, just wrote in and she says um, that she uses baby shampoo um, for soap uh, or shampoo for her loved one, and uh, it doesn't hurt their eyes. That is a great tip, Carol. I would have not thought of that because Karen was just saying that sometimes Jim would put his head down and the soap would get in his eyes. So uh, you might want to try that. That might help in this situation. And uh, I know the Alzheimer's Association has great tips. Uh, if you just type in Alzheimer's and bathing, there was uh, the Alzheimer's Association website will come up. Also, um, help for Alzheimer's families. Uh, there is an app called, um, I think it's called the Caring Companion, that's what it's called, um, and you can download it to your smartphone. Uh, and then once it's on your smartphone, if, um, you can type in the word bathing or a whole host of other uh, things that you might be struggling with, um, like eating, um, all sorts of things. And tips will pull up right there on the app, too. Again, that's on Help for Alzheimer's Families. It'll d direct you to the download on that. Um, so those are just some additional helpful tips. So thank you so much for writing in um, and for sharing your question. Um, I'm so happy hey, that, that you were able to do that. Yeah. Lakeland, I'm sorry to interrupt, but Carol, oh, okay. that was a great tip. Gee, where was she when I was struggling <laughs> with them? But one thing I that caused me to remember um, is make sure you have everything ready before you bring them into the bathroom. Um, so make sure you already have the water to the right temperature, that you do have whatever shampoo or soap, towels, washcloths, baby powder, um, shaving essentials, um, whatever you need so that you don't have to leave them alone in the um, bathroom to just to come out and grab anything. I do recall that that was a tip that I was told numerous times. And um, so anyway, so my tip is also make sure you have everything ready before you bring them to the bathroom to get them started in the process of uh, taking a shower or a bath. That is a great suggestion. And I know that Laura had mentioned that she's tried, her brother has tried. Um, Laura, you might want to consider having someone outside the family, whether it's a friend or maybe you hire a home care company or uh, get a bath aid or something like that, maybe just once or twice a week. Um, if, if your loved one is an, an older adult, they don't have to shower uh, every single day. It's actually better for their skin if they skip a couple couple days in between. So you could try that. See if an outside person, um, someone outside your family would be effective in bathing. It might just be kind of the privacy issue um, that your, your dad is uh, fighting in, in this situation. So again, I hope all of those were helpful. Thank you to all those that wrote in tips. And we did have another question that came in. This is kind of um, moving us back towards today's topic, but feel free to type in questions everyone that's listening, even if they don't relate to today's topic like Laura did, we're happy to cover those. So uh, we're still taking questions. Uh, but we do have Devon. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Um, Devon wrote in, my mother is my father's sole caregiver. They're 61 and 63. My dad hasn't start, has started becoming incontinent, needs help bathing, refuses medication and doctor's visits, and some... Uh, doctor's visits sometimes, and the and biggest of all uh, are the awful anger outbursts uh, with her in public and at home. He's also recently began walking at 3 or 4 in the morning for the day. Our biggest question, how do you know when it's time to consider alternative living options for someone with Alzheimer's? Mm. So Karen, any oh. initial thoughts on that? It sounds like there's a lot of different things going on here and yeah, there is. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, Devon, thank you for writing in. And I am really 
sorry that you're having to go through this with your dad. Um, I, you know, it sounds like he's he's got younger onset because you he's in his early 60s. So, um, so he's my guess is uh, still pretty strong and able, other than having the dementia. Um, so, so I'm really sorry that your that your family is going through this. So. That being said, um, I want to try to cover everything. So Lakeland, um, since I don't have the question in front of me, make sure I touch on everything that she's asked about. Okay. So um, first of all, your mom's safety and your dad's safety are the utmost importance. So if he is at all getting um, violent, that is something that needs to be addressed immediately. Um, because um, not only could he hurt your mom to where she wouldn't be able to care for him anymore or you know God forbid she actually get really hurt um, he would know that he did that and that would um, acerbate the the dementia to where he would know he had done this and um, that would probably cause some depression or he could hurt himself and um, so, so that's something to take into consideration. I know you mentioned that he fights you going to the doctor and doesn't want to take any medicine or go to the doctor, but this is definitely something that needs to be addressed with his physician. Um, and there is medication out there to help with um, violent outburst and um, agitation. So, um, so there, so that's a whole other conversation is to get him to the doctor and to get him to take his medication. There are some books out there. You can go online um, and get, depending on your father and his personality, um, there could be a variety of reasons. And I just don't have enough time or enough information to go into all of them for you. I, I wish I could. Um, but, you know, sometimes the agitation can come from something that you least expect. They know what something's wrong with them and they're scared. Maybe a tag on their shirt is bothering them. I mean, maybe they're cold, maybe they're hot, maybe they're hungry. Um, maybe they have a headache, but they can't verbalize it to you. There's just so many different things that could be causing that agitation. Now, there's also the side of it where they just have the violent outburst because they have dementia and um, that has to be addressed. So, um, so I would talk to the physician. They, they should be able to work with you in trying to get them in at least once, um, if at all possible. I would call their office. They usually are pretty good at dealing with this, if it's a neurologist and somebody that specializes in Alzheimer's or dementia. Um, also, reach out to your local Alzheimer's Association and find a support group and find um, any kind of help that you have in your area. So um, I would definitely do that. And it looks like your, your father is um, probably at some point, if your mom isn't able to continue keeping him at home, he is gonna, uh, keeping him at home, he is gonna need to go into some type of home for his care. And I would go ahead and start looking. It doesn't mean you have to move them in tomorrow, but you know what your options are. Uh, you know how far away they are from the house. You know if they have a waiting list, because a lot of places, especially if it's for dementia and it's a locked unit, they only have a limited number of beds. And um, sometimes you have to get on the waiting list and it could take months, depending on where you live. Um, you also need to look at the cost. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of things that you have to go ahead and start doing now. Maybe you won't ever have to to put him in a home, but the sooner you start and the more information you have and the less stress you feel like having to make a decision today versus maybe a month from now or two months from now um, will help you with that decision making process. So that is something also to take into consideration. Um, and it's it sounds to me like your mom has a lot on her plate. Um, the more you and your siblings can help her, uh, obviously the better it will be. Uh, trying to distract your dad, sometimes distraction um, 
can can help um, as well. I, I wish I had a little bit more information uh, for you, but um, or from you, so that I could give you more. But um, you know, there's a lot of tips for each situation, and I would. I would hope that what I've told you right now is a good starting point, but um, but one thing that you're definitely going to have to do is look out for your mom and make sure that her health and her safety are also remembered um, while she is helping take care of your dad. Now, Lakeland, I think there was another part of that question. Did I answer everything, or did I have I forgotten and, and left something off? Well, I think you covered a lot of it. Um, if I mentioned that he's been wandering or walking, which I guess it, the term we would use probably is wandering um, in the wee hours of the morning, um, so I don't I I don't know if I caught that. I was kind of messaging back and forth with somebody on the line, uh, responding to one of their questions. So I think uh, you covered everything else. But when it comes That's to that. that wandering piece, I wanted yeah. to bring up um, there is something called the Missing Senior Network that you might want to sign your father up. Uh, up for. It's an online website. It's uh, missingseniornetwork.com. Uh, in case your father were to wander, uh, you could send out a quick note to all of your contacts, friends, family, neighbors uh, to help locate him. But um, when it comes to wandering, Karen, do you have any suggestions about that in addition to uh, maybe signing up for that Missing Senior Network, contacting um, I do. Local law enforcement. I know you've, you've talked about how you uh, went to your local law enforcement or signed up, Jim, for some sort of program yeah. through them. So I'll let you talk about that for a second. Okay, thanks. Um, yes, thank you for keeping me straight because Lord knows I need somebody to keep me straight. So sorry about You're that. Doing just uh, fine. <laughs> yes, um, I, yes, this is very important and it is very common. Um, Lakeland, that is a great suggestion. I know uh, what you mentioned is true here. Our sheriff, our local sheriff office does have a free program that you can register and you can actually, it, it is a band that the person wears. And I know there's programs like this all across the country. Um, you just have to, you know, check and find. Again, the Alzheimer's Association may know that. Even possibly your doctor's office may know about it, um, or your local agency on aging may know about it, and or you can just do a Google search. Um, there are some products that you can buy yourself um, if you don't have a program there um, to keep track of your loved one. Basically, where they, it is like a little bracelet that they would wear, um, or even there's some that can go around their neck if they would take off the bracelet. Um, where you can track them. So, but one thing also is if he's getting up and walking early in the morning, um, Jim did this, you know, it's almost like the opposite of sundowners where um, they pace at night, some people pace in the morning. That's going to cause a lot of issues. One with his sleep, he may not be getting enough sleep, and that is an issue with people with dementia that causes other problems. And your mom's probably not getting any sleep because she most likely is getting up when he's getting up and she's probably up late um, at night with him or doing laundry or whatever it is that she's doing, maybe trying to get five minutes to herself. Um, so that could be an issue as well if he's getting up super early and she's getting up as well. They're not getting enough sleep. So, um, so there's a couple of options for that. One is um, to make sure he can't go out of the house. There's alarms you can put on your house as well um, so that you know if a door or window have been open. Um, you could hire somebody to come over and maybe take him for a walk or sit with him or keep an eye on him so that your mom can get some rest or maybe you guys can take turns coming over super early. Um, because that that is actually pretty common and it's scary because you can wake up and then that person's not there and you have no idea where they've gone to and it can be um, very scary and very dangerous We're right smack dab in a very cold winter in a lot of parts of the country and if they're out wandering in their pajamas they may not have shoes or socks on or a coat and um, you know there's some serious health health problems that can come with being um, outside for long periods of time and having that kind of exposure to the elements. So that's something to take into consideration. Again, it goes back to what I said about your mom's health and your dad's health. 
um, being able to um, take care of him safely. So, so that's also something to take into consideration. So thank you again, Lakeland, and thank you, Devin, for uh, that great write-in question. And I hope that this has helped you a little bit. If it hasn't, please feel free to write back to us. That's what we're here for, and we definitely want to make sure that we are answering your question fully. Thanks so much, Karen. Yeah, uh, Devon, we wish you the best of luck in this situation. We hope that we provided you with some good information. Karen had lots of great great suggestions there. And then I think that you'll find uh, the resources that we share at the end to be really helpful. So hold tight for those. Uh, we'll be sharing those soon. Uh, we did have somebody else write in. Uh, Nancy asks, any suggestions on finding a good neurologist? I thought that was a good question. I wanted to make sure we got to that one. Any, <laughs> any suggestions, Karen? Did you um, have to face that with your husband? I did. Like a yes I, from that response. Yes. <laughs> I, I am laughing because um, yes. So there. This is another couple of hour conversation because, um, well, for a lot of reasons. First of all, um, you do need to find a neurologist that specializes in dementias, and because I didn't know this before, but not all neurologists are made the same. Some specialize in strokes, some specialize in migraines, um, you know, some could specialize in ALS or other neurological disorders. Um, so when you're calling around, first of all, the best way to find a really good neurologist is to ask. Ask, um, I know in our support group, you know, people were very willing to talk about their doctor and share the good and the bad. So, um, so it's really good if you are part of a support group to ask them who they see and if they like that physician. Um, our personal story was while we were trying to get Jim diagnosed, we did have a neurologist. He was very well respected, um, but he didn't have a clue. I don't think he'd ever seen a younger onset case. Um, he wasn't up to date with a lot of research and didn't know where to send me. I, I do remember just very distinctly, um, you know, because Jim was so young and we had such young kids at home. I just looked at him and I said, oh, my gosh, what, what am I supposed to do now? What do I do? And he did not have an answer for me. So the next time we went back, I asked him about a support group. And again, he did not ever send us even to the Alzheimer's Association he was going to send me to a support group for people with um, traumatic brain injury, um, which is completely different. So, so we found a new neurologist, basically, and I asked around and, and found one that we did like a lot who, um, who seemed to care and knew a lot more about what was going on. So, so you're going to have to do some homework, and it may take... Uh, a couple of tries to find one that you guys are comfortable with. You need to find one not only that you're comfortable with, but that your husband's comfortable with, um, because that's going to make a huge difference. And um, as he progresses, if he'll agree to go to the physician, just like the um, de the question that Devon just wrote in, or uh, Devon, um, you know having um, someone who doesn't want to go to the doctor or take medicine is a big issue. So you want to get somebody that they're comfortable with. Um, and ask when you call the office. If, if there's nobody for you to um, talk to, like a support group, or you, you don't want to call and ask the Alzheimer's Association, you know, look up neurologists, read the reviews online, and when you call their office, ask if they have someone there that specializes in dementia. And um, you know, if you do have, and this is to everybody listening, if you have somebody that you're calling for, um, that you're caregiving for, and it's a younger patient, ask if they've ever dealt with younger onset Alzheimer's because that, that brings in different issues than somebody um, who's much older. So, um, so you're definitely going to have to be proactive, ask a lot of questions. Um, get out of your comfort zone, and you know if you're not happy with your first choice, um, keep searching. Karen, those are great suggestions. I I never had really even considered asking of a physician you know, if they've dealt with someone with younger onset. That's a really great tip. I'm going to remember remember that for the future. 
thank you so much. Um, we did have one last question that I want to make sure that we get addressed. I know we have about 10 minutes left, and I wanted to save a couple minutes at the end for um, some resources. But Charlene wrote in, um, and she says, we have just started home care for my mother. She has been agreeable so far. However, her temperament and agreement to things will change daily. We're wondering what we should do if she starts to send them away as they try to do more things for her around the house. She thinks she's a good housekeeper still, but she is not, and these things need to get done. Mom still lives on her own, but time is, is, uh, but time is getting short for that to continue. If she does not accept home care, we will worry about um, that, uh, that it means that sh she'll have to go to a nursing home. Uh, and then she also added she was in the hospital for a week, and we told her that she has to accept home care or the doctor wants her to go to a nursing home. So, wow, that's, that's a really tough situation that Charlene and her family is facing with her mom. Any thoughts there, Karen, on maybe how they can ex uh, get their mom to be more comfortable with home care? Um, how to, I don't want to use the word convince, but I'll use that for lack of a better word, convince her mom that, you know, let these home care professionals stay, help you out. So they, they don't have to make the move for her. Any thoughts mm -hmm. there? Yes, that's a tough one. And um, thank you so much for this question and for sharing your story. Um, so a lot of what we've discussed today um, falls under this one, and that is, you know, what's best for your loved one. And what's best for your loved one isn't always the easiest path to take, um, of course. So a couple of things. I had um, someone years ago who told me a story of how they finally got their dad to agree to have somebody come over. They basically um, had the caregivers come over and um, pretend, for lack of a better word on my end, pretend to be a friend, like a, a friend that was just coming over to hang out and a friend that was is maybe going to take them to a movie or to lunch and so forth. And the dad accepted this and just loved the um, the guy. It was a guy they had gotten to come over and a guy caregiver. And it worked out beautifully. And um, so just depending on how you word it sometimes can make a difference or how you introduce um, the caregiver that's going to be coming over into your home. Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons your mom might be fighting it. One, this is her home. This is her private space. She doesn't want anybody coming in here, uh, you know, changing things or, you know, bothering her. You know, I don't know how long she's lived alone, but, you know, if she's been alone for a long time. It can be very um, scary to think about somebody coming in invading your privacy. And she could be worried that they're going to move things around or steal something. You know, sometimes when they get dementia, they get very paranoid about their private things. So, um, so that's something to keep in mind. Try to put yourself in her in her shoes. And what would calm you down? What would make you accept it? Um, obviously, you know her personality better and and things that make her happy. Um, if you're worried about the cleaning, I thought you said something about cleaning of the house and that she's not a really good housekeeper anymore. Um, yeah. Did I hear that? Okay, so. Yeah. Yep, she, what? she used to be a great housekeeper and now not so much. Okay, so one thing, so poor Jim, I would, um, he, you know, it got to the point where that was the way he was contributing to the house and it made him feel so good to help with the laundry or the dishwasher or something. And, you know, more times than not, it just turned into a huge debacle because he would put too much soap in and then we'd have bubbles everywhere or he'd break stuff or he'd, um, you know, one time he took the lawnmower apart because he didn't put gas in and he thought something was wrong with it. So he took the whole thing apart, but then he couldn't put it back together. So sometimes it can get actually get expensive as well, having them help with these things. But it's their way of staying true to themselves and still contributing to helping. So... One thing, uh, if your mom is able to leave the house and you can take her maybe for 
a nice lunch or a movie or um, maybe walking around the mall or just something to get her out of the house for a few hours, you could hire somebody um, or one of your siblings could come over, you guys can take turns and do some housekeeping while she's out of the house so she doesn't even know that you guys are doing it. And she'll probably think that she did it. And she'll be very proud of how clean her house is, and it will make her feel really good, and it will make you guys feel good because she's in a nice, clean house. So um, that's my one offering for that because to keep fighting her on it, um, you know, probably isn't going to go anywhere because, you know, we're all picky about how our house gets cleaned. It's very hard to get somebody to help. I'm sorry, my dog is barking, but anyway. Um, Anyway, yeah, I think those are some great points there, Karen. Yeah, I know we're getting, running out of time, so I That's think okay. the, yeah. um, I know I I don't have a lot of regrets with Jim, but one of the things I do regret is um, being so worried about um, keeping the house clean with him and the kids here and him not doing it correctly. I understand that and I get it because I lived that and one thing I wish I would have done is just let him, you know, do it the way he was doing it and not worry even about going back behind him because, um, you know, chances are a dirty floor isn't really going to hurt anybody. Um, you know, I could go back after he went to bed to do it or something and he wouldn't know, but I was just... I don't know. At the time, you're living it, and you can't see, you know, the forest through the trees, so to speak. And so, the one thing I will say is, if the house, you know, if you don't have, if it's not too bad, I don't know how bad it is. If it's not too terribly bad, and she's not breaking dishes or uh, misplacing things, you know, just let her do however much she can, and uh, and know that that's making her feel good. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, I had some of the same thoughts, maybe involving her in cleaning activities or the activities of the household, but in smaller ways, like having her fold washcloths or, um, you know, having her stir part of the food that's being made. Um, and I, it sounds like this uh, Charlene has home care in there for her mom. And you might want to inquire with the, with the home care organization if they train their caregivers in Alzheimer's or dementia, and uh, if they do, uh, possibly encouraging the caregivers that work with your mom to go through a, additional training, or uh, you could even uh, tell them about the app. I mentioned that earlier, uh, the Daily Companion app for their smartphone that they could download and get some tips. So, you know, if if out of the blue your mom asks them to leave because they're a stranger in the home, it might help them get some quick tips on how to maybe divert the conversation or redirect. Redirecting is something that I'm sure Karen knows well with her husband Jim, if you can redirect them to a act, different activity or get them involved in um, you know, a conversation about a photo in the home or an award that's on a shelf, um, then that can kind of divert their mind or divert their thinking. So uh, Charlene, I hope that that was helpful. Uh, she did write in, Karen, and said, thank you, great ideas. So uh, we want to thank everyone for being here with us today. Uh, and I'll, if we move to the next slide, we have some resources for you um, that I wanted to just quickly run over. We have our helpforalzheimersfamilies.com. I've talked a lot about that site today. It's such a great resource. Uh, there's that app for your smartphone on there. There's also confidencetocare.com with some more great tips. And then, of course, there's our Remember for Alzheimer's Facebook page, and we talked a lot about joining a support group, and I would say for many people, that Facebook page kind of serves as that. We put out lots of great tips, uh, great topics. We ask you guys for a lot of feedback on um, questions for these live chats, that sort of thing, so you can stay connected to us that way. And I mentioned that Missing Senior Network for Wandering. If your loved one is at risk of wandering, it's really important uh, that you have a plan in place and to think about, you know, if my loved one goes missing, how am I going to contact people to help us look for mom or dad? And then um, the GarnerFoundation.org, Karen's organization, and then also I mentioned MedicareInteractive.org. That can help you kind of um, navigate the Medicare space. We've talked a lot about how that is um, 
kind of a comp complicated system that's always changing. So that's a great resource there. And then um, when we send out the email with the live recording, we'll also include a funding solutions guide and the home care guide that will give you uh, some further information on uh, all the funding options for senior care. We talked a lot about how there's so many options, keeping a loved one home, moving them to a community setting, facility setting. Uh, and again, every situation is different. Everyone has different financial situations, family situations. Um, you know, and we wish that we could sit down with all of you individually and help you navigate, but I hope that these resources and that Karen's advice today has been helpful. So uh, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, we will have a live chat next month. We're still nailing down the date in February, but we will announce it both on helpforalzheimersfamilies.com and on our Remember uh, Facebook or Remember for Alzheimer's Facebook page. So uh, if you have any questions uh, or anything that you would like us to address in the next live chat, please email me at livechat at homeinstead. Dot com. We'd be happy to get to those. And if we didn't get to your questions today, I'm so sorry we run out of time. We really thank you for being so interactive. We had lots of great questions coming in. Uh, but I wish everyone a great rest of their day. Karen, thank you so much for joining us. It was so great to talk to you and uh, so great that you were able to share advice with uh, and your personal experiences with these family caregivers that are with us today. So thanks, Karen. Uh, thank you, Lakeland, and I really um, appreciate all of your tips as well because you definitely have um, quite an abundance of them. So I hope everybody um, got some, some good ideas and feel loved and supported after listening, and I look forward to talking to you again next month. Great. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of the day. Take care. Thank Bye. You. Bye.